Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. So a juke joint, no doubt, was a place where people went to dance. Celebrating the relationship between music and freedom. Nowhere else in America is this allowed. The Green Army fights for cleaner air and water. You are not doomed to be an addict for the rest of your life. Tools to combat Louisiana's opioid epidemic. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. More on those stories in a moment here on SWI, the state we're in. But first, we remember a Louisiana legend, Gus Weil. He passed away this morning at a Baton Rouge hospice. Writer, author, public relations and advertising specialist, mentor to many of America's top political strategists. Weil handled the political campaigns of a number of Louisiana governors, and in 1994, as longtime host of LPB's Louisiana Legends program, he became a legend himself. Here's a clip from that program that features Justin Wilson, former Governor John McKithen, and James Carville. Who just happened to be one of my very dear friends. But first, let's find out, find out first just a little bit about this fellow. Huh? Roll the tape, will you please? When I call him every morning, I refer to him as my dear friend. If you look at people who have worked for him and been around him, he, he's a great teacher. He, he, he has a lovable personality about him. No question about that. The world is full of intelligent and smart people, but there are precious too few wise people, and there are precious too few people with with, with real judgment, and I think those are the, the qualities that, that separate him more. And he's your friend in good times and in bad, and when you're feeling the lowest, he'll reach out his hand and buck you up. And I've had some low times in my life, in my unspectacular career. But I think Gus Wilde is a great man. Let's give him a standing ovation. Won't you help me? LPB President Beth Courtney knew Gus Weil as well as anyone. Joins us now to talk about a man you refer to as a renaissance man, Beth. Well, Gus certainly had a myriad of talents. He was an author, a raconteur, a, a public relations man extraordinaire. Yes. Uh, I just remember him so fondly because he was so connected to public broadcasting. He did our Louisiana Legends series. He was a great friend to LPB. Yes, he was. And he did that series interviewing other extraordinary Louisianians for about 19 years. and. Um, but I will always remember when I look back, I, I think of all the really the stalwarts who were involved in the early days of public broadcasting in Louisiana. Justin Wilson, you saw clips of him, and and uh, Gus uh, certainly was one of those. Uh, he was a remarkable man, and he nurtured a lot of people in the public relations business. He had an ad agency extraordinaire, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he, he also was just a great friend throughout our lifetime. My husband Bob and I were great friends of his and, uh, and uh, of his son who passed away. His legacy, uh, it, it goes to so many areas of a legacy uh, that's not typical for someone. They might excel in one or two things. He did in so many areas. Well, he did, but uh, he was such a wonderful character. He had that great booming laugh and he smoked that big cigar <laughs> and he would tell me that every morning he would write. He would yeah. get up early and he would write. So he wrote books and he wrote plays and um, he just was full of life. And uh, I think people like that really are remarkable. He was from Lafayette, Louisiana, but he always knew about the Cajun culture well. He sure did. And he was great friends with Jimmy DiMaggio who started the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana. But I remember he just loved having lunch with John McKithen, big John. John McKithen. Mm -hmm. and he was his press secretary and then executive secretary. He was a man who really uh, 
it was a joy to know him. Beth, thank you so much. We appreciate your thoughts on this day. Thank you. Very much. Louisiana legend Gus Weil died this morning at the age of 85. Here now we'll look at some of the week's other headlines. Louisiana natives wonder if Majority Whip Steve Scalise of Metairie could be the first congressman from the Bayou State to ascend to the speaker's chair. Bob Livingston got the closest to the seat in the past, winning the election but resigning amid scandal before he took the gavel. This is House Speaker Paul Ryan announces plans to retire. California Representative Kevin McCarthy is ahead of Scalise in line of leadership, and some close to Scalise have said he won't seek the seat if McCarthy runs. The billion-dollar fiscal cliff lawmakers are facing shrunk to $648 million this week as the state's income forecasting panel revised projections. The changes are largely tied to the federal income tax overhaul. It does not lessen the dilemma about the funding of state hospitals and TOPS because both would cost the state over $440 million. This week at the state capitol, college students, parents of children with disabilities, and others who rely on Louisiana for services pled for their programs to be spared from cuts. The latest snapshot of education achievement finds Louisiana public school fourth and eighth graders near the bottom of the nation in reading and math scores. Fourth grader math scores suffered a significant drop from 45th to 51st from the previous testing. State Superintendent John White says this year's scores were affected because they were done online for the first time, but other states did not see a sharp decline. No ethics violations charges for four Louisiana State Police troopers who took a lavish detour to Las Vegas and the Grand Canyon as they drove through a conference in San Diego in 2016. The officers are appealing a separate disciplinary action taken by the department after their boss, Colonel Mike Edmondson, retired as head of state police. The ethics board concluded that Edmondson instructed the troopers to make the tourist stops. Edmondson's successor, Colonel Kevin Reeves, demoted two higher-ranking troopers on the trip and permanently reduced their pay, saying their actions were unacceptable. The officer's appeal is scheduled for mid-July. At LSU's Manship School of Journalism Thursday night, former Senator Mary Landrieu served as a moderator on a panel discussing sexual harassment in media and politics. She spoke to a full house, exploring the hashtag MeToo movement and how the conversation has erupted in less than a year. The event was called Hear Them Roar, Voicing the Truth on Sexual Harassment. As elected official, I always felt powerful and was powerful. But this is about women who are in the less powerful positions. I mean, it can happen anywhere, but in less powerful positions, and they feel so, um, you know, without any place to go, and their jobs and their career are at risk. And that's what's wrong. It needs to be stopped, and it's pervasive. And I think now we're taking that more seriously, and that's good. <music> Cleaning up Louisiana, our environment, is the mission of retired Lieutenant General Russell Honoré. His advocacy group, the Green Army, is looking to make some headway this legislative session, and he is here to tell us, I'm going to call it your top five list to improve air and water quality in the state, and let's start with water. Absolutely. Drinking water, too. Absolutely. That's the, the, a vital uh, thing for life. Uh, yeah. Drinking water issues have you know over the past few years as our aging rural water systems and in the city of New Orleans have been challenged. Yes. Uh, infrastructure issue. Uh, one of the first bill I'd like to talk about is HB uh, 633 by Representative Hunter. That bill would require secondary testing for lead. No, we, think we test already, but you want the standards to be tougher. Absolutely. We need to increase the frequency once the system start to fail. The other water bill we had as far as drinking water bill is uh, HB 431 by Representative Marcel. And that deals with the Southern Hill Aquifer, which sits right under Baton Rouge. Yes. That bill has been introduced about three times before. They have been working for nearly 20 years to solve the problem with the saltwater intrusion. And the objective here is to reduce industry use of the aquifer water and have industry use 
use the Mississippi, Mississippi River. Mississippi, like Sh Shell and Dow currently use the Mississippi River water. I want to ask you about this. We pride ourselves in calling ourselves a sportsman's paradise, but any kind of a paradise wouldn't have litter along the road, which you see way too often in Louisiana, and in the waterways. Absolutely. Uh, anything that you'd be introducing about that or hope to see happen? We hope in the coming year. In the coming year, okay. Uh, as a part of our next year legislature to work on plastic bags. First as an information campaign that as people don't take them at the store because they're a nemesis. Mm -hmm. To stop using bottled water repetitively, use a reusable because they end up being a big part of litter. Right. And to start a litter campaign because that's a part of pollution that we create that we don't have to have. I know that air pollution is always a concern. Uh, briefly, uh, anything addressing that? We have two bills, uh, one by uh, uh, Representative Katrina Jackson, uh, Air Bill HB 863. What that bill would do is create a requirement for DEQ once a plant, be it a refinery or a chemical plant or any kind of plant, violate the Clean Air Act on multiple occasions, then the DEQ would be able to direct that company at their cost to put air monitors in the community, which is a fair thing to do so the community has confidence that the air that they breathe in, if there is an issue, that they know about it immediately. The other one we're working in the final bill is HB 431, by Representative Marcel from Baton Rouge. This is what we call the Colfax Bill. In Colfax, uh, there's a company burning uh, army ammunition right. and pyrotechnics from Disneyland. We've done a health survey on Colfax that clearly demonstrate that there's a spike in cancer, particularly thyroid, in that community and it's related to the type of chemicals coming out of that open burn. And literally what they do is they put a piece of metal on the ground, they put some diesel on the top of some ammunition and burn it. It is the only place in America on private property where that technique is being used. And the people of Colfax are very concerned about mm -hmm. it. Many of them are sick. And the purpose of that bill is to get them to find the alternative technology, in other words, fix it, stop the process if they can't fix it, or move to another location, because nowhere else in America is this allowed other than in Colfax, Louisiana. No other state will accept this type of burning. We'll see how your success is this session. General Honoré, always a pleasure. Your website, uh, greenarmy.com? That's it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Go check it out. Thank, Thank you, and thanks to LPB for what y'all do. General Honoré also against a bill that would stiffen the penalties for people protesting oil and gas pipeline construction sites and even trespassing on certain sites. A proposal by Opelousas Democrat Dustin Miller that would allow private and public schools to administer an antidote to opioid users in the middle of an overdose moved out of committee on Wednesday. It's one of half a dozen bills this session addressing the state's opioid epidemic. Senior producer Kevin Gotro updates the battle. Logan Kinnemore's experience with opioids began with injections at the age of 17 and lasted for about a decade a standard time frame, he says, for addicts. The vast majority of people will age out of their use on their own. If they are, you know, safe and kept safe from overdose. Kinnemore stopped using at 27, which coincidentally, he says, is when the brain's higher decision-making skills fully develop. Plus... I was tired of that lifestyle, and for me, um, I had goals in my life that I realized were you know, that my problematic drug use was incompatible with achieving those goals. Once the decision was made to stop, Kinnemore's family's financial means allowed him to immediately begin the road to recovery. 
I had treatment on demand basically like I told my family I needed help and we went the next day to talk to these people and I was in care a day later uh, most people don't have that without prompt access to help when needed opioid addicts may quickly revert to using to avoid the agony of withdrawal Louisiana's Department of Health has received a two-year eight million dollar federal grant that is helping to address that delay in each of the 10 state regions it governs. Karen Stubbs is the agency's Assistant Secretary of Behavioral Health. So we're actually able to place a person in those offices. Um, it's a peer, um, someone who has, is in recovery themselves to assist with recovery out, um, efforts of their clients. This person will also do um, outreach to places like emergency rooms and local jails in hopes that we can get people who are ready to enter recovery and treatment um, when they're actually ready and make those immediate referrals. The grant also allows the department to help distribute Narcan, an anti-overdose drug, throughout Louisiana. The U.S. Surgeon General last week issued a rare advisory urging more people to carry the antidote. In 2017, paramedics with EMS used the drug to save more than 600 patients in Baton Rouge alone. In America, we really focus on um, we want somebody to get well, of course we want them to get well, but sometimes we can be very judgmental and we don't take kind of the European approach and that's harm reduction. Jan Kosofsky is executive director of the Capital Area Human Services District. The agency provides community-based addiction services for the seven parish capital region. She says one challenge for recovering addicts is the shortage of medication-assisted treatment programs which use drugs such as methadone to combat opioid abuse. Oftentimes people think about methadone in a very negative way. They think you're replacing one drug for another. But the reality is, wouldn't it be better that we face up to the fact that we may lose folks if we don't give them a, something that, first of all, gets, addresses some of the fear they have for going into detox, which is a very painful detox. The agency is also implementing a clinic to dispense Vivitrol, an injectable drug which blocks opioids for approximately 28 days. Jan Laffinghouse is program director for Addiction Recovery Services. So it helps folks with their cravings, which will, um, you know, kind of block that negative reinforcement of, oh, I don't want to withdraw, I don't want to have that mental obsession. And then you'll also, um, you know, have them um, not being able to get high or overdose at all. And so this that's a good thing, and so that's, that's the positive reinforcement there. The clinic was made possible through the Medicaid expansion. Statewide, over 13,000 people have used the expansion to cover substance abuse, outpatient, and residential treatment services. In February, Louisiana also received a waiver from the federal government for inpatient stays, one of only five states, Stubb says. This allows us to waive the cap that Medicaid, federal Medicaid places on stays of 15 days. So we're now able to allow um, clients the ability to stay in their inpatient residential treatment for whatever amount of time is appropriate for that person. In 2016, Louisiana was one of eight states that had more opioid prescriptions than people. Since tougher state legislation passed last year, the number of prescriptions has already decreased over 2 percent just since January. The Capital Area Human Services District will soon be helping to bring those numbers down even further. We are very, very pleased to get a federal grant through the Office of Women and Children's Health that focuses on girls and women um, who are the most rapidly growing group of people who are becoming addicted to opiates now. In fact, about 40 percent more women are addicted than men. Um, and what we see is that health care providers are more apt to give women um, pain pills. The grant will cover public awareness outreach efforts on the risks of painkiller abuse. I think one of the most important things that we need to do is make sure that people understand how addictive these pills are, that you can really become uh, habituated or conditioned to use them w within three and four days. Kinnamore says challenges still exist for the uninsured seeking access to detox, something LDH says it is working on. His group, No Overdose Baton Rouge, continues to advocate for compassionate policy for recovering addicts. In November, Baton Rouge became one of only two cities in the state to allow needle exchange, 
which can help to prevent the spread of HIV among opioid users. Despite the obstacles, Kinnamar wants addicts to know that recovery is possible. And you can learn new coping mechanisms and new ways of dealing with the world. You know, our human brains are incredibly plastic, and so you are not powerless. You know, you are not doomed to be an addict for the rest of your life. You can and will learn new behaviors. You can and will change. And there's hope out there for anyone. For SWI, this is Kevin Gotro. Kevin, thank you for that. For help battling opioid addiction, you can visit the Louisiana Department of Health website at ldh.la.gov. You know, people associate New Orleans with jazz and Acadiana with Zydeco. But what about the capital region? Well, for the Baton Rouge area, it's the blues. Juke joints dotted a stretch of highway in West Baton Rouge that was known as the Gold Coast. Those were blues bars that fostered local talent like Slim Harpo, Buddy Guy, and the Neal family, who you can see this weekend at the Baton Rouge Blues Festival. LPB's Kelly Spires is here with this story. Kelly? That's right. I sat down with Kathy Hambrick and Angelique Bergeron with the West Baton Rouge Museum. They just opened a new permanent exhibit about the relationship between music and freedom. So a juke joint, no doubt, was a place where people went to dance. They didn't worry about a dress code. You could go right after work. And most times people were working in the fields, in the sugarcane fields or cotton fields. And this was the one place they could go after work, let their hair down, so to speak, and just have a drink, have their friends, wives, girlfriends over, and they danced to the music. We are a regional history museum here at the West Baton Rouge Museum, and so a big part of the tour here is uh, about slavery. And so we start the tour um, in our 1850s cabin that came from the Allendale Plantation. Then as we look at the history of Jim Crow, Reconstruction up until the Civil Rights Movement, and the music over 100 years, let's say from 1900 to the present, you look at the evolution of music, one of the key components of places where that music was played in rural areas is at Jew joints. The building itself is a part of the exhibit. Um, people passing here on 6th Street and Jefferson Street see the museum and wonder what this old tin roof building is. Um, but when you walk through the screen doors and walk on that wooden porch, you immediately notice all of the 45 records and um, the memorabilia from juke joints and nightclubs around South Louisiana. One common denominator in a juke joint would be an upright piano. There was always a piano player. Uh, you might not have very many other musicians, but there was always an upright piano. Well, musicians would have uh, made music with, with whatever they had. If it was a box you had to beat on, you know, musicians will make music. These are early instruments that then, you know, are, uh, become the banjo um, and later the guitar. Um, but, I mean, musicians can make, make an instrument out of anything, make music with anything. Folk artists use materials, found materials, in order to be creative. So just as visual artists use maybe scraps of copper, scraps of wood, to create sculptures and add to their mixed media paintings. Then when you look at musicians who are the early artists, some of the early artists in American history, they were using found objects. East Baton Rouge Parish had blue laws which meant that you could not sell alcohol on Sunday. So last call on a Saturday night would be midnight. Um, and you know, the club could stay open a little bit, let you finish your drink, but um, they didn't stay open very long. Um, so lots of patrons would, would cross the river and come here to West Baton Rouge, to the Gold Coast, and to other places where um, there was tons of clubs and music and, and good times that went on all, all night long.
all night long, music and people coming from all around, stopping off the highway. So you can imagine, in many cases, this was a crossroads, just like they say Highway 61 in Mississippi is the crossroads for the blues. You think about it, we have this wonderful bridge, the ferry, the river, the Mississippi River. Just think of the numbers of people who are traveling on this river, working as longshoremen, working in the sugarcane fields as truck drivers, people passing on this highway. What is the Highway 190? Was the thoroughfare connecting to Highway 61, so Port Allen was a place where you could stop any time of night have a cocktail, a drink, and get live entertainment and dance the night away. Oh, the patrol why you got me Put me in, pulled out in jail We deal with some pretty heavy subject matter here. I mean, no doubt. Um, you know, day after day, to have our docents, our volunteers, to have to interpret this history or interpret this history to the public, and what better way to end a tour about slavery than to understand that music is the ultimate expression of freedom. The artist featured here was Kenny Neal, who played a huge part in helping this exhibit come together. You can visit the Juke Joint Museum during museum hours, available online at westbatonrougemuseum.com. Looks like an incredible place. Thanks for bringing that to us. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.